so let me just tell you very briefly um, sort of who I am and my trajectory and how I got to where I am today. Um, I actually grew up in central Indiana in a really small rural farming community. Um, very rural high school, didn't have any AP classes or anything like that. Um, but I happened to grow up 30 minutes from Purdue University. And um, going through high school, I was good at math and science, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. And, and somebody said to me, oh, you should think about engineering. I didn't know what it was. Um, so I said, OK, I'll think about engineering. Um, but I honestly, I didn't know what it was. And I didn't know any engineers. And the only reason that I thought about it was because I lived really close to Purdue, and it was supposed to be a really good engineering school. Whatever it was, I was supposed to be good at it. And it was supposed to be about math and science, and so maybe that was something I should think about. And the other thing, at the time at Purdue, you couldn't transfer into engineering. So if you wanted to be in engineering, you had to start there, and you could transfer out into science or something else, but you couldn't transfer in. And so, really, my entire decision was, well, maybe I'll start there and try to figure out what it is, and if I don't like it, I'll get out. Okay? And that's how I chose my my discipline to start in. And um, I did decide, because I was going to college so close to home, that I wanted to be a co-op student and maybe co-op far, far away. That was kind of the agreement I had with my parents. I'll go in-state, I'll stay close for college, but mom, I'm, tr I'm gonna co-op and I'm gonna, you know, move somewhere. And it turns out the co-op program at Purdue, you had to sign up for it after your first semester of your freshman year, and you had to say what kind of engineer you were gonna be. And, you know, it wasn't, you know, this was um, in the 80s, and they didn't have that course that you all take your first year to help you understand what the different disciplines were. And remember, I, I didn't know what engineering was, and so when I had to decide on a specific kind of engineering, I had taken, you know, calculus, chemistry, and physics, and maybe, you know, an English class, right? And then they were saying, what kind of engineer do you want to be? And so I got the, the form, and I had to check the box, of what kind of, in, of engineer I was going to be so they could tell me what kind of interviews I was going to get for my co-op. And I looked down the list and like half of them I'd never heard of, I didn't know what they were. So I crossed those off. And then I was left with a couple, you know, like mechanical and chemical and electrical and maybe that was about it because I didn't know very much, maybe civil. And I at least heard of those. And I had had a particularly bad day in physics. Okay, I, I had had a physics test, it had not gone well, and I thought, yeah, I don't want to do mechanical like that. <laughs> yeah, this is not good. But my chemistry class was going all right, and I checked the chemical box. Okay, literally this is how much I knew when I picked my major. So I chose chemical engineering and ended up uh, co-oping for um, a company that was one of the best places to go in the mid-80s to be a chemical engineer. How many people have heard of Eastman Kodak? Yeah, it gets less every year. <laughs> so in the mid-80s, Kodak, what did, who knows what Kodak did or made way back when? Shout it out. Film. film. Okay, film. And it was a chemical company. They made film. And what Kodak did better than anybody else in the world was coding. They knew how to thin coat things in all different kinds of chemistries. And it was a great place to go as a chemical engineer. And so I went to Eastman Kodak. And it was in Rochester, New York. And so I, like I told my mom, I was going to move away. Um, and it was through my co-op that I actually realized I liked chemical engineering. Because remember, I didn't know what it was. It turns out I didn't like it at Purdue in my classes. So I would take a semester, I'd be like, I really don't like these classes and maybe this isn't the right major, and then I'd go co-op and go, wow, I really like this work. This is interesting. And I'd go back to school and go, this is nasty, right? And so I had this really odd experience as an undergraduate of not really liking the coursework. It was very theoretical. I didn't understand how it applied to anything. Um, was not very hands-on, okay, at that time. Um, and I did well. I got good grades. But I didn't feel like I understood it. I didn't really, like I didn't connect with it. I wasn't passionate about it, okay? But when I went to work, I was like, this is really interesting stuff. Like I like being an engineer. I like what engineers do. So the first thing I would say to you is, I, I'm convinced that the only reason I stayed in engineering major is because I co-opted. 
I think if I hadn't been getting those work experiences, I probably would have changed my major. And I stayed in it because I realized that I liked the kind of work that engineers do, and I differentiated that and could distinguish that from what happens in class that I wasn't really enjoying, okay? So as I was getting ready to graduate, I um, was sure I wanted to go work in industry, right? This idea of going to grad school, remember I didn't like the classes very much. Um, when I going to go to grad school, I wanted to go work in industry, and so I applied for a number of positions in the fall, like some of you may be doing now, and I had some plant trips in the late fall, and I had some job offers, and I wasn't interested in any of them. So I had a couple offers from Kodak and from Dow Chemical and you know, Eli Lilly and you know, some DuPont and big chemical companies, great places to go work, and I didn't like any of them. And I just went, oh man, I just spent five years doing this and I don't like any of these job offers. And I ended up running into a professor in the hallway and he said, how's it going? I said, well, I'm looking for a job and this is what I'm finding. And he said, well, it's because that's not the kind of work you, you don't want to do BS level work. And I didn't even know what that meant. Like, I didn't understand what that meant. That, that the type of work that you do isn't, you know, coming as with your undergraduate degree would be really different from the type of work that you would do after graduate school. And I went to talk to him and he said, you know, when I told him what I liked and the kinds of things I wanted to do, and I had done some undergraduate research as well, and he's like, you need to go to grad school. You're not getting the kind of jobs you want because you don't have the right kind of degree yet. I said, oh, like I didn't know that. So second thing I would point out, it just happened that I ran into this professor in the hallway. Okay, I didn't know enough to go ask those questions of somebody and to get that kind of advice, even as a senior. Like I didn't know how to do that, right? But it turned out that having that conversation with a faculty member and having them help me think about and kind of walk through where I was and what I was experiencing changed my entire trajectory. Because because I had that conversation, I started looking at graduate schools and I applied. And the same faculty member said, where are you gonna apply? And I said, you know, here are the, the five places. And they were all kind of the typical top places you would look in chemical engineering. And he said, you need to look at Rice. And I said, what's that? I've never heard of it. And he said, it's in Houston, it's a small school, and it's not in the top you know, 10 in chemical engineering, but they do, and I had done some uh, biomedical research, and he said, but they do a lot in bioengineering, and they're really good at it, and you should take a look at it. I think it could be a good fit for you. Again, I'd never heard of it, but I was like, okay, I'll, I'll apply there too. And it turned out, you know, I applied there, and I got in, and I went to visit, and I loved it. I loved the environment. I love the kinds of things they offer. Um, I ended up going there thinking I was just going to get my master's and go take a job, but I liked it so much that they convinced me to stay for a PhD, and I did. Um, and the whole time, I was planning to go work in industry again, because remember, I love the work. And about a year before I was going to graduate, um, a number of schools started opening bioengineering programs. So I was still in chemical engineering getting my degree, but my research was in biomedical engineering or bioengineering. And um, a lot of bioengineering programs started popping up around the country. And I was working in a pretty big research lab. There were about 20 of us in the lab. And all these people that were a year ahead of me started placing into academic programs as faculty. And I had never even thought about that as a career path until a whole bunch of people in my lab started moving into those kinds of positions and um, decided maybe that was something I'd try as well because I, at that point, realized I really liked being on a college campus. Um, and so I decided to apply for faculty positions and I got a position at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County and I took it, I took that particular job offer even though it was not a top school because my husband could get a job in Maryland too. He works for NASA, he's an aerospace engineer, and he was at Johnson Space Center when I was in Houston. And so when I started job searching with my PhD, he said, okay, here are the you know, six places in the country you can look. You know, you can get <laughs> right? I could look in California in a couple different places, I could look in Cleveland, I could look in Huntsville, I could look in you know, around Kennedy in Florida, and I could look at Maryland. That was my list. Now, map that onto faculty positions, as you know, right? And then are the kind of positions that you're looking for. 
and your, your list of places to apply starts getting pretty small. So I got a job offer at a place that actually was going to work, and I was like, I'm there, <laughs> accepted, right? And I thought I would go there and spend um, a couple of years, and you know, we would figure out if that was a good fit, and maybe I would go back into industry or you know, do something else again. And I ended up staying there for 23 years. Okay, and funny, you know, funny thing about it, um, my class that I hated the most as an undergraduate was fluid mechanics. Okay, <laughs> but I had a, I had a horrible professor who took attendance at 8:30 in the morning, sat in front of us like this, opened the textbook and read word for word, and, and it, he you know, required attendance, and we all sat there with our highlighter and highlighted the book, like whatever he said. Um, it was mind numbing. And, and I didn't understand it, and I hated it. And when I went to graduate school, I ended up doing um, research that was related to fluid mechanics, so I had to get my act together and really figure it out. And at that point, I decided it was kind of interesting, and I liked it. Um, and so then I went on to teach undergraduate fluid mechanics for 18 years. Um, yeah, so I, this is my penance, right? For, <laughs> so all of you that are sitting there going, I hate, who, who was it that organic chemistry is like killing me, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> you don't know what the future holds. Because if you would have told me when I was at Purdue that I was going to teach fluid mechanics, I would have laughed and you know on the floor. Uh, and so so would everybody else that studies with me. Uh, um, but but you know what I learned from that really is that um, I love being on a college campus. I love working with students, and that I turned out I didn't hate the material in chemical engineering, I really was struggling with how it was taught and, and how it was connected to the things that I cared about. And so having that experience as an undergraduate was something I took with me when I started my faculty position to really think about how do I teach differently so that my students don't feel the way I felt when I was sitting in these classes, right? And so that had a huge impact on me. And so another thing I would say to you is sometimes you have negative experiences with things and that can always teach you something if you let it right and that can always help you grow in some way if if you recognize it and you let it help you grow and you're all going to have times when there are things that are hard or you don't like or things don't go very well stepping back and asking what you can learn from that and how you can use that to be better somehow in the future um, i found to be really productive um, so as a faculty member, I came up through the faculty ranks, um, became a department chair, I did that for seven years, uh, went away on fellowship because I couldn't decide what I wanted to do next with my career, and um, ended up coming back from a fellowship um, as dean of the College of Engineering and IT at UMBC, and I was dean there for three years, and then came to Virginia Tech a little over a year ago as dean of the College of Engineering. So, I've had this trajectory that um, when you look at it on paper, looks like all the steps just kind of clicked into place. I have sort of a classical um, pattern of somebody who would move into an academic position and come through the ranks and become a dean of engineering college. If you look at it on paper, it's very, you know, kind of linear and you go, yep, that was the right amount of time and that and that, you know. And one of the things I want to share with you is that's not how it felt for me going through it at the time. Because remember when I told you I was sure I knew what I knew what I wanted to do and it was going to industry? Like there were several times in my path where I was sure I knew what I wanted to do and every single one of those I was wrong. <laughs> really. You know, I really was. It, like I thought I knew and what happened was something else presented itself that turned out to be more interesting than what I thought I knew I wanted. And so, you know, another message for you would be, like, be open to those opportunities that are a little bit outside the normal thing that might your, come your way, that might stretch you a little bit in a certain direction that you're, makes you a little uncomfortable, or to give you a little bit different kind of experience than your typical experience you're getting, whatever it is. And it can be something in the academic space, it can be, you know, a club that you're in, it can be completely outside of anything that you do in classes. But those things are going to be the things that um, sort of help you navigate the space as you move through your career and can give you some um, 
different types of experiences to help you make good decisions. And, you know, if I had followed the path I thought I was going to be on, I would be in a completely different place. And like I said, if you would have told me when I was an undergraduate that I was going to be doing what I'm doing, I could have given you a really long list of all the reasons why that wasn't true. Okay? And yet here I am doing what I'm doing and I absolutely love it. And so, you know, my kids, and you know, I'll share this with you and then I'll let you ask some questions. My kids um, often feel like they're supposed to have it all figured out. How many of you often feel like you're supposed to have it all figured out? Okay, you totally don't. I don't have it all figured out. Um, I, you know, I think my kids say this to me a lot. Like, they're really stressed because I'm not sure, you know, I, my daughter's 19, she's a sophomore, she's trying to figure out her first internship, so she's like doing her very first interviews, which is actually really funny. Um, <laughs> she was just texting me earlier today. She's in computer science and she had to do a coding test at her first interview ever. And it was, it was on the material that she's learning in the class that she's in right now. And so I got this really long text that made me laugh out loud. But anyway, <laughs> anyway I was like, that's great. Um, good, good, good first experience. Um, now you know. Um, but, um, you know, she's like, you know, how do I get the perfect internship? What's the right perfect internship I should be getting? Should I be looking, you know, and she's like stressed about this. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like, it so doesn't matter. Pick one that sounds fun and make sure you learn something while you're there. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter which one you pick. What one sounds interesting today? Pick that one, right? And go with it and learn from it. And that's going to help you make your, your next decision. And that's going to help you make your next decision. Right? You just have to keep moving through the space, making the best decision you can at the time, and not feel like you have to think about that decision that's five decisions out. It's like, what am I going to do with that graduate? You're a sophomore. Go do an internship somewhere. <laughs> Learn something. Right? So you know, I think as I look at my own path, what I did, and, and I didn't know I was doing it at the time, but what I did was put myself in positions where I would have opportunities, make sure that I did things that would make me prepared for opportunities if they came along. And then when an opportunity presented itself, I made the best decision I could in the moment about what felt right at the time. And then I moved on to the next one, right? And, and doing it that way, at least for me, took that pressure off of feeling like there's a grand plan that you have to go and reach for, okay? And, you know, I think the, the piece of that was being ready to jump at the opportunity when it comes. Right? So it's not just giving yourself experiences that prepare you to take advantage of the opportunity. It's being willing to grab it when you see it. Right? So three years ago, four years ago, you know, I was Dean of Engineering at UMBC, and I was not looking for a job. When Virginia Tech, you know, when the position opened here, I was not interviewing. I wasn't looking for a job. There wasn't, you know, I was perfectly happy where I was. And yet an opportunity presented itself and I had put myself in a position where I was ready to say, yes, that's an opportunity I want to, I want to grab and I want to run with. Right? And so you don't have to have it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. I don't know what I'm doing next. I might do this for you know, 20 more years. <laughs> and I might not. I don't know. Right? But I can tell you that today I love what I do. And I'm doing it to the best of my ability. And I'm doing things that stretch me in lots of different directions and make me learn new things. Okay. And so I'm going to close there by just saying, you know, don't put too much stress and pressure on yourself around all of this. Um, it will figure itself out as you move through the space. And if you take that first job and it turns out two years into it, you're like, whoa, that was a mistake. This isn't what I want to do. Okay. You, you know, do something else. Right? So you don't have to get it right every time. You just have to do your best and learn from it 
and then decide what's going to come next. So let me stop there. I'm happy to talk about anything y'all want to talk about. You can ask me any question you want. All right. Thank you.